Hello everyone, welcome to session 12 of Biostatistics for Biomedical Research. Frank Harrell here. Um, we're using the version of the notes that are dated January 25th, 2020. And today the topic is correlation. We'll talk about the different kinds of correlation coefficients, uh, what they mean, uh, how they can be fooled, um, and we'll talk about confidence intervals for correlation coefficients, uh, sample size calculations, and then we'll spend a little bit of time uh, dealing with the case where you have lots of correlation coefficients and you're tempted to select the ones that look impressive. What sort of hazards uh, are there in doing that and how do we account for that sort of selection process which could involve double dipping. So we'll cover that with the bootstrap method and some Monte Carlo simulations, some simple simulations to help uh, explain to you uh, what can go wrong when you have lots of correlations. So let's turn to our notes. This is a simple table that summarizes some of the types of correlation coefficients you might be selecting uh, for uh, different types of variables. Uh, plus mentioning some other analysis methods. So we start with the case of an interval uh, outcome uh, measures, a continuous type of variable, and a predictor that's binary. And so if you're going to assume normality in that case, uh, we often think of this as a two-group uh, problem, two-sample problem, and don't usually use a correlation coefficient, although you could. And we use two-sample t-test or linear regression, which makes a normality assumption. You could relax that with other methods. If your outcome is ordinal but is not continuous and your predictor is binary and you don't have normality, uh, you can do a Wilcoxon two-sample test or its generalization, the proportional odds model. And, of course, the Wilcoxon test works perfectly okay in that first situation where you have normality. If you have a categorical outcome and a categorical predictor, uh, that might be represented by an R by C contingency table of frequencies, and you might test that with a Pearson's chi-square test or uh, a polytomous logistic model. If your outcome is interval scaled and your predictor is interval scaled and you have normality and linearity, uh, you might use a regular uh, linear uh, correlation coefficient or linear regression. If your outcome is ordinal and your predictor is ordinal and you don't have normality or don't want to assume normality and you you don't want to assume linearity but just want to assume a monotonic effect such as always increasing or always decreasing then Spearman rank correlation would be a very good choice and Spearman's works pretty well too for for continuous X and Y. Now, uh, it's good to look at associations uh, between variables and scatter plots, of course, are especially good when you have interval scaled or continuous X and Y variables. So we're going to start with the Pearson product moment linear correlation coefficient. It has this classic formula. Uh, this is a covariance. This, this is a crossed, a cross variation or cross variance called a covariance and these are uh, products of uh, variances or things that are proportional to sample variances. So you have this sort of uh, covariance divided by the square root of the product of variances flavor to the correlation coefficient uh, and it has a range of minus one to one um, and it's a unitless index of the strength of association where positive values of R indicate a positive association and negative values uh, the reverse association zero no association so it measures the strength of the linear relationship between x and y it's really not so good for very nonlinear relationships and you can test for significant association by testing whether the population correlation is zero now given all of our reservations with hypothesis tests uh, we, we definitely have reservations here, and I think testing for whether a population correlation coefficient is zero is quite silly in the majority of cases in which this test is used because it's really of interest to gauge the strength of the correlation uh, than to test whether it is zero. I've even seen papers where somebody asked, well, is, 
is age correlated with height in in kids and uh, you know it has to be correlated with height the question is how how strong how much noise is there in the system but this t statistic is the correlation coefficient times the square root of n minus 2 over the square root of 1 minus r squared it's identical to the t-test to test whether the population uh, r is 0 um, and and you can uh, get this from linear regression and get the same t-value uh, and then you get the p-value in the usual way you can also do a one-tailed test if you only wanted to look at one direction of correlation now I mentioned that hypothesis testing can be quite boring uh, for correlation coefficients so what's of great interest is confidence intervals so we have a range of plausibility for the unknown correlation coefficient and Fisher derived uh, many decades ago this Z transformation that will take a Pearson uh, correlation coefficient and come up with a Z value that is closely normally distributed for a decent size N and this value of Z has a uh, normal distribution with a standard error of 1 over the square root of N minus 3 so that's the basis since we get a normal distribution for that we back calculate uh, to get confidence intervals so um, this is just showing the back calculation uh, in all of its detail and so given the value of Z you can solve for the R value and we'll let the values of Z vary to give us a certain tail coverage um, and that's how we'll get a confidence interval for the R value which you'll see soon so here's an example from uh, Doug Altman's terrific book uh, we get a Pearson's R for studying how basal meta metabolic rate relates to total energy expenditure. We get a pretty high correlation of 0.73 in only 13 women. What is a 0.95 confidence interval for that? Well, the Z value for that R is 0.925. Um, the lower limit is given uh, for the Z and the normality scale is given by this equation. Uh, and the upper limit by just adding instead of subtracting the normal critical value times that quantity and then we back calculate to get the R and so we get a 0.95 confidence interval for the correlation of 0.3 to 0.91 so you might be overly confident by quoting a correlation of 0.73 because the data are consistent with it being all the way from 0.3 to 0.91 and this is just some more code that goes through that particular calculation. So what if you wanted a more robust measure of correlation that did not assume um, uh, uh, normality or especially did not assume linearity? Well, uh, we can use Spearman's row, which is sometimes called just row or R sub S. It assumes a, an always increasing or always decreasing relationship between X and Y, but it does not assume uh, linearity and so the way you can get Spearman's correlation is you take your original data and you rank the X column and then you separately rank the Y column and then you do the regular Pearson R on those two columns of ranks and you get exactly the Spearman's row you can test for Spearman's row equals zero using this same um, test statistic we had before and this is a pretty good approximation to getting an exact uh, p-value. Again, we have to question whether we're really interested in testing for a zero uh, correlation. So we're going to look at some correlation examples now to get some insights uh, to help you interpret correlations. So we're going to generate 50 data points that have population correlations 0 0.2, 0.4, and then we're going to plot uh, the data that's generated and we're going to plot the true we're going to show on the plot the true correlation as well as the sample correlation um, and we'll, let's go ahead and go in and look at the plots so you can see uh, the sample that was generated from a population which X and Y are truly not correlated the true R is exactly zero we have a pretty weak correlation in our sample because we have sample fluctuations 
So we don't get a zero correlation exactly, but we got a correlation of 0.17. Uh, there's a T statistic for testing that if you wanted to. And the Spearman's row is 0.14, it's not too different. Uh, and you get a T statistic for testing that. If the tr population really had a correlation of 0.2 and we drew this sa a sample from that population and we might get an observed correlation of say 0.22 and the Spearman's row happened to be the same thing, um, a stronger correlation in the population of 0.4 uh, we actually estimate that with these data points that were simulated to be a Pearson R of 0.3, and the T statistic for that is showing some evidence of a non-zero correlation. The T statistic for Spearman's row is about the same, and the Spearman's row is about the same. And you can see we're just moving up in the strength of the correlation in the population, and we're getting stronger correlations in the sample. Um, and the, and the correlations are looking to be more precise the bigger the population correlation is, which is definitely true. You're seeing larger T statistics, and now we have a true population correlation of 0.9, a sample of 0.88, with a Spearman's row of 0.84. So you can see the effect of sample size into getting more precise estimate of the correlation coefficient. And you start to get a feeling for what sort of scatter are you going to see when the correlation is 0.4 or 0.2. Uh, the next thing is to show uh, if you had the same correlation um, but different setups of data points, uh, how, how weird can the data look and the correlation really be unchanged? So in all these cases, the true correlation is equal to point, um, seven, and so the first data set that's generated that has a correlation of 0.7 in the sample correlation coefficient is this one, so that's what a 0.7 correlation looks like. Of course, a lot of people square the correlation to get the proportion of explained variation, that would be 0.49, and that's not a bad idea. Here is a setup where you would think the correlation is really high because you have a perfect straight line for your raw data points with just one exception, but that one is, is a sort of a high influence point because it's at 30 away from the mean of these points. And uh, that one point can bring that correlation from one that you would have here all the way down to 0.7. That's an example of something uh, that's not robust. Likewise, we have no correlation here, but one point can change everything. Being a high leverage point, if you connected it down here, that's going to have a lot of weight that will pull the correlation away from a flat line up to a slanted line so that the overall correlation is 0.7. Here's a relationship that's not one-to-one, -one, um, and so you have disagreements in the Y values for the same X. Uh, but uh, with all the cancellation you get from the different points, the overall correlation is still 0.7. Here's something that is very non-monotonic, reverses direction, but we have more points on the right side, and they're farther out uh, a little bit. And so uh, the weight is going to carry the correlation still to 0.7 overall. Here's a very weird situation, but it can definitely happen where in this lower X range you have a negative correlation, in this higher X range you have a negative correlation, but uh, by the time you look at the best fitting line between these sets of points, that best fitting line is going to say, well these are separated enough that we're going to get a positive slope when we look at all of these points. Uh, most people would say this is not a very robust analysis, but the correlation that you get from this overall high uh, positive correlation is 0.7. So I think that's pretty informative about how you can go wrong with a simple correlation coefficient. Now what about uh, correlation versus agreement? Agreement is a different task than looking at correlation. Um, so let's say we want to look at lung function measured using a spirometer uh, versus a peak flow meter. Um, and Or we have two devices for measuring the acidity in the esophagus. Uh, 
as a marker of reflux. So we might have an oropharyngeal and a conventional device. Um, and so um, one uh, approach begins with a scatter plot or one method versus the other. Uh, and so we can look in figure 4.11 here. Um, this is something we had earlier. We have large numbers of measurements per patient and a lot of patients. And you can see there's kind of a systematic disagreement in the two measurements for, for trying to measure the same thing. If you're trying to assess agreement and you use a correlation coefficient, and you might get in this case a correlation of 0.9 and conclude there's good agreement and that's really not the way to do it. What, why is that? Well, the correlation coefficient measures the degree of linear association, not agreement. And so you could be off by 0.5 on an increment or you could be off by a factor. Um, so you could be off by a factor of two and the correlations could still be one. So you don't want to use a measure that that doesn't penalize you for being off by a multiple or a constant. Um, what you want to look at in an agreement study is really exact agreement. And then correlation depends on the range of the data. So larger ranges lead to uh, larger correlations. Uh, tests of significance are irrelevant uh, to test whether the correlation is different from zero and feel good about agreement would be a major mistake. And so even a p-value less than 0 0.0001 uh, is not going to be impressive. Uh, this is uh, just showing that if you restrict the range of the data on, on one of the variables, the correlation uh, will, will go down compared to using all the data. So data can have a high correlation but have poor uh, agreement. And uh, what you want to look at for agreement is really agreement. And the simplest way to deal with that is the mean absolute discrepancy between the two measurements. That approach is talked about in detail in uh, a later session and deals with Chapter 16 of the BBR notes. Now, Bland-Altman plots are used uh, to examine agreement, and they can be quite useful. Tukey, uh, before Bland and Altman, he had developed a similar concept using uh, the mean difference plots. So you, you create a plot of the difference in the measurements on the y-axis versus the average of the two measurements on the x-axis. If the two devices agree or two measurement types agree, the difference should hover around zero. The average of the two devices measurements is our best estimate of the true unknown value that we're trying to measure. But what's cool about the bland altman plot and the Tukey mean difference plot is the measurements can vary in a systematic way over the range of measurement. And you can learn about that by plotting the difference versus the average instead of just looking at the mean absolute difference overall, ignoring the, um, the midpoint of the two measurements. And so um, there, there is a concern about the bland Altman plot is should you be plotting the average on the x-axis versus just the reference measurement. And so this guidance from Crower concluded that when the two measurements have nearly equal variability, so you're comparing two field measurements and not comparing a measurement with a gold standard, the Bland-Altman approach is preferred. But when one me me measurement is a reference standard, having much less variation than the field measurement, the reference standard or gold standard should be on the x-axis. So this is just drawing um, a bland Altman plot for the data set that we looked at before. And so this is a very big data set. And there's a non-parametric smoother put on the, the values here on the different scale. The difference is on the y-axis, average is on the x-axis. So you want that um, difference to hover around zero. And we're seeing here it's hovering around something. It takes a dip here but it's not really at zero, not close enough. So there is a systematic difference in these two measurement devices. And then you can look at how, how much extreme differences you could get over these many, many data points. 
Next, we look at the sample size needed to estimate a correlation coefficient. Um, and I say estimate, estimate because we're more interested in that usually than in hypothesis testing against a zero. So how can we derive a sample size formula for this estimation problem? Well, we can use that Tukey Z uh, formula and um, we can choose, we can get a confidence limit for any correlation coefficient that's approximately accurate. Uh, and we can choose the sample size so that, so that the margin of error or half width of the confidence interval is acceptable. Now, one thing that happens with the Z transformation is that the precision for estimating a correlation is at its worst when there's just pure noise. So when the true correlation in the population is zero, you're going to have the most variation in your sample correlation estimates. As the true population gets very high, let's say 0.9 or minus 0.9, uh, the margin of error for estimating the correlation is um, much smaller. But if you don't know anything about the correlation, it's best to plan for the worst. And so we'll tend to emphasize calculating a margin of error when the true correlation is zero because that, that will cover all the cases. In the RH MISS package, there's a function called plot core precision that makes the plots uh, very easy to make. And you can see that when you vary the true correlation uh, and you have a zero here, that is when you're at the black line, which is running on top of all the others. And the red line is when the true correlation is only 0.25. So you can see your precision or margin of error is really at its worst for the small correlation. And if the true correlation is 0.75, the margin of error is a lot lower. Uh, but we'll normally use that black curve. And then what is on the x-axis is our sample size. So you can see if you didn't know anything about the correlation and you wanted the margin of error to be 0.1 or half width of the confidence interval, or you can use since these confidence intervals are not symmetric, you can use the maximum of the length on the right of the point estimate or the length on the left, whichever is worse. But if you used 0.1 as your limit for your margin of error, you can see you need 400 observations. This is quite shocking to most people because you see a lot of correlation coefficients calculated with an N of 10 or 20 and you can see that if you have a 10 or 20, your margin of error may be you know, easily plus or minus 0.3. You don't really know very much. Um, now, if you observed a correlation of 0.4 and the margin of error was 0.3, you have some information about it being positive, but you don't really have good information about exactly how strong is the correlation. So to get a decent margin of error takes 400 subjects uh, in the worst case. Uh, now, what about comparing two correlations? Well, I'm re not really presenting how to do that because I don't think it's usually very appropriate because the correlation coefficient uh, is unitless and you could have a variable being double the magnitude of another and the correlation coefficient doesn't change. Uh, and by the time you compare two correlation coefficients, these different scaling issues that cancel out in the correlations, you shouldn't really let them cancel out. So for that reason, we really like to compare effects on a real scale, such as a slope. Is the slope in one relationship stronger than the slope in another? So the slope is not unitless. It's in the units of y over x. And that's usually the basis for comparison. Now what about over-interpreting correlations? Um, so what happens is researchers often compute a lot of correlation coefficients and then they make a big deal out of the largest one. Uh, if you think about how functional uh, MRI is analyzed when you have lots of voxels, maybe thousands of these, and you have brain activation measures for each voxel, and then they may be correlating that with some other external measurement about the patient to, to look at uh, how that correlates with brain, brain function. Uh, they may pick the voxels where the correlations are highest and then make a big deal out of those voxels and actually get a p-value for those for the association. Um, 
So they're using the data to tell you which elements of the data to really do an inference on, and that's just classic double dipping. So double dipping is using the same data set to tell you which features to test, and then testing those features. So this is inherently, when you look at a correlation matrix, or just a lot of correlations, this is a ranking and selection problem. And the data are often not having enough information to give you a reliable uh, choice. So this can really be shown by simulation. Um, and so we're going to simulate a sample size 50 subjects from a 10 variant uh, normal distribution. So we're using a multivariate normal distribution. And we're going to end up using one with a known correlation matrix. Uh, it's actually kind of hard to specify a correlation matrix. You can't just make up numbers because you'll easily find that that correlation matrix is singular. It, it doesn't, uh, the matrix of the correlations doesn't invert. And really to get, to generate the random numbers we need, we need a, a non-singular correlation matrix. So a really easy way around this is just take a small sample size and generate some totally random numbers and calculate the observed correlation matrix. And just because the sample size is small, you're going to get some pretty big correlation coefficients just by a random chance when all the population correlation coefficients are equal to exactly zero. So we're going to use the MVT norm package in R to uh, draw samples from a multivariate normal distribution. We're going to start by having 20 subjects where the covariance matrix is a diagonal matrix, meaning uh, the 10 variates are all uncorrelated in the population. Uh, but when we uh, sample, we see that we have a lot of uh, correlations that are away from zero. So here's one that's 0.48. Here's one between variable 1 and variable 10 that's minus 0.49. These are all just random uh, noise because the true correlations are zero. So we're going to use that observed correlation and pretend it's a true correlation matrix that we would like to estimate. And now just to make sure we're doing things right, if we take a random sample of 50,000 subjects from a covariance matrix equal to that observed correlation matrix up here, and we see how far from our true population correlation matrix that this, uh, those sample, the sample correlations from those 50,000 subjects, how far are those? You see that um, they're very close, rounded to the nearest two decimal places. Uh, there was not a discrepancy more than a 0.01 correlation with this large sample size of 50,000. So, so that's just a check on that what we're doing is right. So let's go back to our sample situation with a small sample size of 50, and let's get a random sample of 10 variates on 50 rows with that population correlation matrix. And when we round those correlations to the nearest uh, 0.01, you see that our sample correlations are, uh, are looking this way. And we want to know how are those mimicking as a whole the population correlation matrix that we wished we knew. And now we're going to take a side uh, track here just to say that when you're looking at a lot of correlations, if your margin of error for estimating a single correlation was almost zero, you would have a great chance of estimating all of your correlations accurately. So being able to estimate one correlation fairly accurately is key to getting a decent estimate of, a, of an entire matrix. So what is the margin of error for this situation? Uh, we're going to take the margin of error to be the spacing between the correlation and its lower confidence limit or the spacing between the correlation and its upper confidence limit, whichever is greatest. So we're going to get confidence limits based on the Fisher Z transformation as earlier. And we're going to do this for four hypothetical correlations, uh, 0 to 0.75. So for a sample of size 50, the margins of error for estimating the correlation, well, it's at its worst when the correlation is small. It's a whopping 0.28. If the true correlation was 0.5, uh, meaning you're explaining one quarter of the variation and why, it's still a pretty big margin of error. By the time you get to 0.75, uh, you're, you're explaining about half the variation and why. Um, 
your margin of error is 0.15. And so the, uh, the ability that we have to estimate the correlation closely is going to depend on what the true correlation is that we don't know. If the true correlation is 0.5, our margin of error is uh, plus or minus 0.24, which you might take as uh, something to help guide our interpretation below. Now what we're going to do here, we haven't really used the bootstrap yet in the course. The bootstrap is a very handy technique that allows you to simulate how things work uh, without having theoretical distributions and doing Monte Carlo simulation. Uh, we're going to do Monte Carlo simulation in a few minutes so you'll see the difference. But the bootstrap, um, in, in this setting, we're going to form a data matrix of n rows and p columns. And uh, p is the number of variables being correlated with each other. And then we're going to take our observed data, but we're going to take a sample with replacement from uh, our observed data. And that sample is going to be a sample with replacement of the original size, such as 50 subjects. And we sample the rows of our data matrix to create this sample. So since we're sampling with replacement, um, you're going to get um, some rows sampled more than once. They're going to be duplicated. A few rows will be sampled three times, and so on. So for every bootstrap sample, which is just a sample with replacement from the rows of our data matrix, we're going to compute all the correlation coefficients using the same formulas that we had before. Um, and, but now we're just getting empirical correlations on sort of messed up versions of our raw data. We're going to rerun the selection process that we may have used to select impressive correlation coefficients. We're going to do that uh, exactly as we did with our original sample on these samples with replacement. And we're going to repeat this sampling a thousand times and look at the distribution of the selections over the thousand repeats. Now the flavor you should be getting of what the bootstrap is doing here is you're finding out what's going wrong with double dipping. So with double dipping you select something and then you brag about it which is like um, firing a gun at the side of a barn and then drawing a circle around the uh, bullet hole and, and claiming you hit the bullseye. So the bootstrap can really study double dipping and penalize you for double dipping. Now the first thing we're going to really bootstrap is the bias in the largest observed correlation. So this is something simpler than ranking all the correlation coefficients. We're going to estimate the bias in the largest observed R. Now when you use the bootstrap to estimate bias, which we're going to use in model validation, um, that's a slightly different bootstrap than the one we just outlined, uh, and you'll see in a minute. Uh, so we're going to draw a sample with replacement from the rows of the data matrix. For each of these samples, find which pair of variables has the highest correlation. Now we're going to go back to the original sample and track that variable and compute its correlation in the original sample. So we find which is the best correlation in the sample with replacement and say if the best correlation is between variable 2 and variable 4. Now in the original sample, what is the original correlation between variable 2 and variable 4? That's going to drop off. So that degree of drop-off is measuring the bias. So how much does your correlation that you brag about as being the maximum, how much does it fall off when you go from the bootstrap sample that you used to discover the correlation versus the original sample that you're evaluating that pair of variables correlation in? So we're simulating the process used to find the largest correlation. So with our simulated data with 10 random normal uh, variables and a known correlation matrix, we are talking about 10 times 9 over 2 possible correlation coefficients that we're going to do some data mining on. Now we don't want to be looking at the non-unique correlation coefficients because you know a correlation matrix is symmetric. So we really have 100 numbers in our matrix but we have 45 above the diagonal and 45 below the diagonal. So we're just going to look at the, the ones above the diagonal in the upper triangle. Um, and we 
We also don't want to look at the diagonal because all the diagonal correlations are 1.0. So what is the maximum correlation if you exclude the diagonals? Well, the maximum observed correlation is 0.685, um, and it's not that horribly overestimated compared to the true value that we happen to know for this pair of 0.604 in the population. Now, that highest observed correlation was the correlation between the second and the tenth variable in our analysis. And that happened to be the 38th distinct correlation. So if you just lay out the upper triangle of our, of our correlation matrix and you go uh, through that triangle, you'll find out uh, this highest correlation is the 38th correlation when you view the correlations as sort of a strung out vector and not a matrix. So if we tabulate the difference between the sample estimates and the true values, uh, our mean absolute error was 0.11. So over the 45 correlation coefficients, how far off from the population value that we wished we knew um, are our sample correlations? So we're off by an average of 0.11 uh, correlation. And that's ignoring the direction of how we're off. And this shows the distribution. So there's a few cases where you're off by 0.3 in one direction or 0.2 in another, but we're hovering around, say, being within plus or minus 0.2 of the true unknown values. Now we're going to repeat this finding maximum R procedure that we just did, but instead of doing it on the original sample, we're going to do it on the bootstrap sample. So we're going to sample from our original data set with replacement of the rows a thousand times, each time computing a new correlation matrix from that sampled rows of our raw data. Now this whole thing took, I think, less than a second. So this is a very fast kind of simulation. So we're going to do something a thousand times. Each time we're going to sample with replacement from the numbers 1 to 50. Replace equals true. And then when you take your original data, which was a 50 by 10 matrix, and we take these rows. Well, if you sample with replacement, some of these values of B are going to be duplicated, and you'll get a row more than once. So, and you're going to reorder the rows and duplicate and triplicate some of them. That is our bootstrap sample of raw data. Now we're going to get our correlation matrix on the new raw data, or it's really bootstrap data. And we're going to pull off the correlation matrix from that, and we're going to store that in R, get the upper triangle of that, find out which element is the maximum. And then um, we're going to say if, if the one that was a maximum was number 38, we're going to give ourselves one point. So we're going to be calculating how many times the one that we found was the maximum correlation. Was it that same pair of variables in the bootstrap samples for which the correlation from that sample was the maximum. Um, so that's, that's going to be a useful thing. Now we're going to compute the correlation for the bootstrap best pair in the original sample. This is our bias estimator. So we're going to get the, the R value for the best observed correlation in the bootstrap sample. And um, we're going to hold on to that and evaluate that same one in the original sample and uh, we're going to add up those drop-offs and so when you do that uh, we see at the end that the number of bootstraps that selected the original most correlated pair was only 642 out of a thousand and what was the mean drop-off for the maximum R? Well on the average uh, we found from the bootstrap that the the correlation that you're claiming is the highest of all 45 correlations is too high by 0.07. It stands to reason that something you're searching for being high is going to be overestimated, just as if you search for the correlation that was the smallest, it will be too small by something like 0.07. Um, so the one that was, that's too small, the, cor the smallest correlation is all in all likely is going to be negative correlation. So for our data set within is 50, we expect the maximum observed R out of 50 
is bias high by 0.07. So if you were just double dipping, you would say, well, the original correlation is what we're going to quote in our paper. Um, and if you wanted to correct for the double dipping, you would subtract 0.071, which is not that bad idea, but there is a note here that the precision of your corrected estimate is going to be worse. And so there is a price to pay because we don't know the bias exactly. We had to estimate the bias from the data. It's also worth noting that we're not used to talking about estimating bias from the data. That's something that's really hard, but the bootstrap gives you a way to do that. It just doesn't guarantee that that estimate of bias is very precise. Now let's, gonna do, let's do a more difficult task. We want to bootstrap the ranks of all of the 45 correlation coefficients. So this is where the bootstrap is really cool. And so we can do a more comprehensive assessment that really quantifies the difficulty of the task in ranking all of the correlation coefficients. Now stop a minute and think about how widely applicable this process might be. You see in biomedical research a lot of biomarker research where there's many, many candidate biomarkers. I've seen many applications where there's 2,000 candidate proteins and they might be correlating those proteins with some phenotype um, on, on just a couple of hundred patients. Uh, and in genome-wide association studies, it might be far worse than that, where you might look at 500,000 features. And so it's a very difficult task to select SNPs or proteins and to say, here's the winner, here's the losers. The bootstrapping the ranking of this process is a great way to quantify the difficulty of the task. So you're quantifying the uncertainties in the ranks of the original correlation coefficients uh, or in, say, uh, uh, biomarker research, instead of ranking correlation coefficients, you might be ranking Cox uh, model hazard ratios. And you'll see that in, in a lot of biomarker research, when you do this process, that a biomarker that is the best biomarker out of 200 candidate biomarkers, if you only had 50 or 100 patients, you might only know that that biomarker is not in the 10 worst biomarkers. You really don't know it's the best. You just know it's not in the 10 worst out of, uh, say, a couple of hundred candidate biomarkers. So the apparent winner is the one receiving the highest ranking uh, among all of the correlation coefficients. So what's the distribution of that rank over the bootstrap samples? And then we can calculate actually a confidence interval for the rank of the marker or of the variable. Uh, we can get a bootstrap non-parametric percentile confidence interval for the true unknown ranking of that feature combination and for all the rankings of all of the examined feature correlations. So we're going to bootstrap the correlation matrix and re-rank the correlations. So for each pair of variables, we're going to calculate the 0.95 confidence interval for the rank of that correlation among all the 45 correlations that you examined. So the rank has to be between 1 and 45, where 1 is going to be the, the lowest correlation, which will probably be negative, and 45 will be the highest correlation. So for each observed correlation, we're going to compute its rank among the 45 distinct pairs. So we're going to start by getting the original ranks of the 45 correlations of this upper triangle of the correlation matrix. And then we're going to do a sample a thousand times with replacement, each time computing a new correlation matrix. And so we get a sample with replacement on our original data matrix, X. We're going to call it a bootstrap sample, XB. And from that, as a raw data set, we get a correlation matrix on XB. Pull off the correlation estimated Pearson R's, and we're going to save the, uh, we're going to get the upper triangle. That's going to give us 45 correlations in the same order we had before in the original data. We're going to rank those from 1 to 45. We're going to save those rankings in the ith row of this uh, matrix REM. So this matrix has a thousand rows for a thousand bootstrap samples and has 45 columns. This whole process took about a second.
And now um, we're going to get the quantiles of the ranks over the rows, over the bootstrap simulations, um, and we're going to get the the 0.025 quantile of the ranks and the 0.975 quantiles for each position. And then we're going to print those in a way that can be understood. So here's a variable that originally, a pair of variables, when you correlated them, was ranked the 22nd lowest correlation out of 45. The bootstrap confidence interval for that 22 is 12 to 34. So we can't really nail that down really well as being the 22nd lowest correlation. The data are consistent with it being the 12th lowest and the 34th lowest. So this is taking into account the difficulty of the task. Now something that came out the 40th, it's going to be a higher correlation. The confidence interval is 32 to 45. Now we're going to be interested in, say, looking at the um, the, the, the lowest correlation, it actually had a very tight confidence interval from Bootstrap of between 1 and 2. So we have a little more confidence that the one we, that had the smallest correlation was either this, this, the smallest in truth or the second smallest. The one that was ranked the highest that we might be more interested in, the Bootstrap confidence interval is 40 to 45. So the data are consistent with the one we're claiming to be the best really being the sixth best. Now we're going to do a Monte Carlo simulation. The bootstrap is an approximate method. When you really have a theoretical distribution to sample from, you can do Monte Carlo simulation to get um, exact calculations if you do enough thousands of simulations. Um, it's just that Bootstrap, the beauty of it is that you don't have to know whether something has a normal distribution. You don't have to know the population that you, yet, that you sampled from. But Monte Carlo simulation, you have to know all the truths. You have to know it was normal. You have to know the true relationships. If you know that, you can sample from it. You can do it very easily. So we're going to compare the Bootstrap result with a Monte Carlo simulation to see if we get a similar uncertainty of that highest rank of 45. Um, so we're going to get the frequency distribution of ranks in repeated actual simulated studies. Uh, so we're not sampling with replacement from one data set, but we're getting whole new data sets for a thousand times. Uh, what is the frequency distribution of the ranks in the repeated studies of the apparently highest correlation in our study? The repeated studies will also have the same sample size and will be generated from our population correlation matrix. Remember that our original maximum correlation was the 38th element in the strung out correlation matrix from the sample. So we're going to set aside a vector of a thousand ranks that are going to be independently calculated over these thousand Monte Carlo simulations. For each simulation, we're going to get a multivariate normal sample. This is going to be a 10 variate sample uh, on 50 subjects with the population covariance matrix equal to our original correlation matrix. For each of those simulated data sets, we're going to get the correlation matrix and we're going to take the upper triangle and now we're going to get the ranks of those 45 numbers and then we're going to pick off the 38th element of the triangle. So now we are getting uh, the recalculated rank of that pair of variables, uh, but in totally independent, newly created studies. And what is the table of that? Well, you see that uh, in out of these 1,000 studies, in 594 of them, um, the one that we found was the best in our small sample was also found the best in these studies. So there is some ability to find the best correlating pair of variables. Uh, but we did get as bad as the one we claim being the best in a couple of samples was the 34th smallest. So it was about 10, 10 ranks off. Now if we get the quantiles of those ranks, we're getting an interval, uh, and that's 38 to 45. I believe this is a little more accurate than the bootstrap. Uh, the bootstrap tends to underestimate these rank confidence intervals just a bit. 
In reality, it doesn't matter so much. Those confidence intervals are almost always disappointing to the researcher already. Um, and so our um, interval is 38 to 45. Um, now, we are looking at 10 variables and we're correlating them. Uh, if we had estimated many more correlations, uh, the difficulty of the task of ranking hundreds or thousands of correlations just goes up and up and up. Uh, so let's actually study that. So we're going to consider a thousand possible associations with a single uh, outcome variable y that's a continuous normally distributed variable. And this time the predict potential predictors are going to be assumed to be independent of each other. This makes the task a little bit easier and it surely makes the simulations run a lot faster. So all of our analyses are going to be conditional on the original x matrix that we generate once. We're holding the x as constant and that we're simulating new y's for each of these 1,000 uh, simulated uh, uh, studies. Now we're going to create a y variable such that the first 10 x's are the only ones that matter. They are the only ones that have any predictive ability and they're going to have a regression coefficient of 1 for x1, 2 for x2, and 10 for x10. So it's 1 to 10. And so you see those regression coefficients here, x sub 1, the first column of our data matrix, multiply it by 1. The second column you multiply it by 2, all the way to the 10th column you multiply it by 10. So we've created a situation where in the population, the 10th column of x is the most important and it will have the highest correlation with y. The 9th column has the second highest true population correlation with y all the way down to the first column, but then the um, x sub 11 all the way to x 1000 in the population, see they're not mentioned in the formula for the expected value of y. Uh, they have nothing to do with y, and so they have a true population correlation coefficient that is 990 zeros. Now to get, have, to get random variation in y, we're gonna take the expected value of y which is just a thousand numbers, and we're going to add random normal deviates or residuals to those with a standard deviation of 20. And then we're going to get our original correlation matrix between the thousand x's and the one y. It's a vector. So now RO is going to be a thousand correlation coefficients, and we're going to uh, uh, print the correlation coefficients for the first 10 from our sample of size 50. Now these correlation coefficients should be going straight up from a very small number to the biggest number. Now you can see that uh, this one is completely out of order. This one is out of order. This one is, is very small and should be getting bigger. Uh, the one that is the biggest is the one that's truly the biggest in the population uh, out of these 10. But what happened to the other uh, 990 correlations? Well, you see a lot of them are right around uh, plus or minus 0.1. But we did get one as big as 0.5 and one as small as minus 0.5. So we almost found one that had a true correlation of zero that was estimated to have a correlation greater than the largest of all the estimated uh, really correlated variables. So that's what happens when you have a lot of opportunities uh, for data dredging. So the 10th uh, the uh, x was the one with the largest observed correlation, and that's this element right here. And now what we're going to do is to do a simulation uh, where we, we're going to save the rank of the, ones, uh, of the one that was observed uh, to be our best correlation, which was the tenth element. We're going to, a thousand times, we're going to get new y, simulated y's. We're going to take the same mean y, uh, so we're going to, that means we're conditioning on those covariates, uh, those ten important covariates go into expected value of y. We're conditioning on x, keeping that the same from what generated our sample data. So we're kind of taking away a source of variation here. 
and then we're generating new Ys with the same amount of residual variation as we had when we generated our original sample. And then we're going to get that correlation matrix, a correlation vector. It's going to be a thousand correlations. And then we're going to rank those from one to a thousand. And we're going to pick off the one, which is the tenth one, uh, that we found as the largest one originally. So now what rank did it have out of the lots of uh, a thousand correlations in all of these Monte Carlo simulated studies? Now this is the distribution of the ranks of the best one, uh, if you round the ranks to the nearest 10. So you can see one time, the one that was really the thousandth smallest, in other words, the biggest, it actually came in as the 350th smallest. Uh, so you see some other ones that are pretty far out here, but a lot of times it came in, say, in the top 10. Um, and the, the interval is uh, 771 to 1,000. So you can think of this as an uncertainty interval. Um, what is our difficulty of the task? So the thing that we said is the most correlated variable uh, out of all those thousand correlations, uh, the data are consistent or compatible uh, with that correlation being ranked 771 all the way to the, the truly very best of 1000. How often was the apparently best correlation in the top two? Well, in 139 cases, and remember this 294 is after you round to the nearest 10 rank, but in 139 cases, the, the best correlation came in uh, top one or two in our Monte Carlo simulation. Um, and so I think this is very instructive for understanding the difficulty of the task. So the apparent winning variable could fairly easily be the 771th largest uh, instead of the 1,000th uh, ranked correlation. The winning variable was in the top two and only uh, a little over a tenth of the simulations, uh, but it, it was in the top 10 a lot more often. Now in chapter 20 of the BBR notes, there are more ways to quantify limitations of high dimensional data analysis, including the case where the number of features is much larger than the number of samples. And in that chapter, uh, you'll see examples where instead of correlation coefficients, it's looking at stability of odds ratios for finding associations among large numbers of features. So as always, I uh, hope you'll use uh, datamethods.org to uh, ask questions and have discussion to follow up on the session. And I look forward to seeing you in the next session.